What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Day One Radio right here on Live Hip Hop Daily. I'm Maurice Garland in, my, in the building with my man BP. What's happening, man? Ain't nothing, man. Just grinding through the week, brother. You know, it is what it is. We appreciate y'all watching on Live Hip Hop Daily. Appreciate you listening through our partners at CLNS Media way up there in Boston, man. And, you know, this week, we like we always say, man, our, our whole thing is bringing you stories that you've never heard before, stories that haven't been told correctly and this week we got a a little bit of both and we got family in the building you know it's been a, a long time coming man my my, my homeboy my brother from another kelvin coffee in the building and we have shit actor and 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 man is way older than me and still in uh. way better shape than <laughs> i've ever been in in my entire life so you know he does a little personal training <laughs> as well uh, brother that Coffee introduced me to many moons ago when I lived in New York, Nation Curse, and both of these brothers are here to talk about About the People, which is a short that's uh, showing at Bronze Lens Film Festival. I, I heard uh, at Martha's Vineyard Film Festival and at the Shorts, Hollywood Shorts Film Festival, it was like standing ovation type shit. Yeah, man, it was, um, it was pretty good to see, pretty good to notice that, like um, at Martha's Vineyard, which was the first screening, you know, everybody kept asking, um, when is it going to premiere? When is it going to premiere? And, you know, you you don't answer those things because, mm -hmm. you know, it's way too early and you right. don't want people to get tired yeah. of asking you. So it's exciting to see, but you can't re respond to it until it's, it's go time. So we premiered um, two weeks ago at Martha's Venue on a Tuesday, and I wasn't expecting what I received at Martha's Venue, to be honest. Like, you know, they had a Q&A after each filmmaker's film was shown. And, you know, regular questions like five, you know, s six questions or whatnot. And then at the About the People show, they asked with the filmmaker there. And I was, you know, I was hesitant to get up at first. <laughs> hmm. And then I stood up. And next thing you know, man, I actually got a, a standing ovation uh, walking t towards the front. And then when I got to the front, I got like 15 questions thrown at me right away to the point where they had to shut it down. And then everyone that was in the audience that had, you know, didn't get a chance to ask the questions, they just ran back there to where they saw me stand up and come from. And it was pretty much the same thing in Hollywood, in L.A. That's you know, they didn't ask any of the, the filmmakers any questions. We all stood up there at the same time. All the questions was directed towards about the people. So it's like walking into an experience like that. I mean, you don't put your blood, sweat, and tears into something like are reactions like that considered a quote unquote success? Like, would you still have been proud of, like, if you showed the film and you're like, well, shit, I know we did our thing. They ain't asking us shit, but <laughs> I know I did a good job. You know what I'm saying? I don't know, man. It's, I, I can't, I enjoyed it and I didn't enjoy it because it's really happening. So the fact that it's really happening takes away from the moments hmm. of me being able to enjoy it. You know what I mean? Like, it's, it's a film that's about what's really going on with us as people of color. Mm -hmm. So when I get the hand claps, I'm like, yeah, you know, that's all good, damn near sweet. But Tamir Rice should still be alive. Right. You know, Trayvon Martin should still be alive. So I don't know if I really accept the fact, or it's hard to accept the fact that I'm getting, you know, a standing ovation. Yeah. You know, and that, and that could just be the, the writing side of things. Mm -hmm. You know, it's been that I wrote it because it was hard to write. But that could that you know that could easily be where that's coming from. Hundred percent. Now you guys have worked together on, on films in the past. Um, Nashawn, what what was it about this? And you play the professor yes. in the video. You like the the intellectual cat in the room. Trying to be um, in the film. What what <laughs> <laughs> what was it uh, about the role when you when you read the script that made you get it? Like not this ain't just my homeboy. And I must be like cool with it, but oh, yeah. this is something I actually want to do. No, um, when I read it, I fell in love with it right away because it was just so poignant and so right now. Yeah. You know, and it resonates now. It resonates all the time. So it's kind of like how he wrote it that, you know, there's no character names. Everybody is a profession. Yeah. Like you're, you're the senator, you're the professor, you're the author, you're the college boy. Like nobody has a name. We just go by what we do and it's so clever the way it's done and it's just it's like 12 angry men the movie 12 angry men but it's it's our version of it it's just us in this room and we 
taking out ideas and trying to figure out how do we save the black community? How do we put what we have? Everybody has a pinhole inside the community. How do we make that work to right. make our community better, make it better for black people? And I read it, I was just like, man, I got to be a part of it. I, I didn't care which character I played. I just wanted to be in it. Right. Uh, for me, when I saw it, it felt like this is the conversation that black people have in a room after something happens when nobody else is around. Yeah, mm. yeah that's you're cool. exactly yeah. right. It was, it, was, it, was, it was written to be a secret meeting, so you're exactly right. Yeah, that, that's how it came a, a across for sure for me, and it was like, what were the emotions like on the mm. set? Because for those who, you know, hopefully everyone will see it eventually, but those who have not been able to see it at Martha's Vineyard or, or Hollywood Shorts, or if hopefully you get to see it here in Atlanta on Wednesday the 22nd at 2.30 p.m. at Bronze Lens Film Festival. What, it's, it's a very powerful piece that goes through all of the emotions that we go through after a tragedy happens in our community, whether it be police brutality or police shooting, whatever the situation is in our community. How are the emotions on the set? Because you got a lot of dynamic personalities and great talents yeah. on this on, on this film. I think the the emotions were raw, which mm -hmm. is good, and it ran the gamut of anger to sadness, disappointment, fear. So it, it touched every emotion that you could possibly have in people and. And I, we all went at each other, and we all, you know, pushed each other. And it was, it was just like, it was a natural feel. Like it's everybody came and they did their job, and we worked and we panned this out. We, how many days did we, did we shoot? Uh, shot two days, one day rehearsal, two days shooting. Yeah. So it was wasn't that much time to actually, you know, to go through every single thing in that one day, couple yeah. hours of rehearsal. But because it was so real, we all just came together and knew what it was about and we just knocked it out. It was natural. Why such a short, you know, filming time? Was it a, like a scheduling thing or was that on purpose? Like, no, we need to capture all this lightning in this bottle yeah. in 72 hours. <laughs> <laughs> no, because of the fact that, because of the fact that it's um, a short film okay. and a lot of, a lot of the actors, you know, with SAG, we're all union, right? So when you book for a gig, you're only working through Monday through Friday for union gigs. So we knew regardless of the fact that that Saturday and Sunday, you didn't have to work. So it wouldn't interrupt or interfere with any of the actors' schedules of doing whatever they were doing at the time. Mm -hmm. So that's why we shot it in such a, a two day, in two days. And, and speaking of the actors, like obviously, you know, you have producers you worked with, you co-produced, wrote the film. Yeah. Um, and some of these are personal relationships with Bray, you got, Nation in the film. You got Diggy. You got Dorian Missick. You got Ebony Obsidian. You got my man who, it was super funny. I texted you earlier. I yeah. love the show The Blacklist. And yeah. the whole time I'm watching the doc, I'm like, I know this dude from somewhere. And it literally didn't hit me till today. You got Hashim Tafik who plays in The Blacklist. Yeah. Um, and you got, obviously, Michael Kenneth Williams yeah. in the movie who we all love from Omar Chalky to you yeah. know, all yeah. the roles that he's done. Like, A, how did you get all of these people to join this cast? And it's not about no BS. Like, this is a real movie. Like, this movie's going to piss some people off. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, <laughs> I already seen it piss um, some people so. off <laughs> in, uh, in L.A. Really? You know, that L.A. crowd was different than Martha's Vineyard crowd, right? Because, you know, uh, I mean, you know, they both was great film festivals, and Holly Shorts is bigger than Martha's Venue uh, film festival, but Martha's Venue is named Martha's Venue's African American Film Festival for a reason gotcha. versus Holly Shorts Film Festival, there which is right, you know, in the middle of Hollywood. Yeah. So I saw some of those people at, that actually got up, you know, when certain things were said in the film, especially when they called somebody an orange <laughs> and they got up and just walked out the theater. And I was like, yeah, I, I mean, you know, I got it. But as far as, you know, as far as the cast is concerned, while I was writing this, man, I actually had all these guys in mind, but I didn't go to them and ask them for a favor. Mm. That I didn't do. I sent it to Nation and was like, yo, take a read. I sent it to Diggy. It's like, yo, Dig, take a read. And they all hit me back. Like, Nation hit me back. It's like, what character am I? Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. That's the reaction, you know. What, that what I, character did you think you were gonna be? The the um the businessman, the the uh, executive. Okay, executive. Exactly. Yeah. Gotcha. So, <laughs> so I had him at first. I had him as the executive, but then I moved them to the professor, and the executive and the professor, you know, they they, they speak the same language, yeah. but it was something more about Nation where I was like, you know what? I can see him being a professor at Brooklyn College yeah. or, or or NYU. You know, we shot it in New York. So those that's why I'm thinking of those schools. So that's how I went about, you know, getting certain cast members. And then with Mike, I went to Mike and I just told him what the deal was and yeah, how so for those who don't know, Mike is Michael Kenneth Williams. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. So yeah. when I went to Michael Michael Kenneth Williams, I'm sorry. Mike is like my older brother. Yeah. So I just say Mike. But yeah, so when I went to Mike, Michael, I was just like, listen, man, um, this is this is what happened to my son. That was it. Yeah. He was on board. He didn't even know it was a script. Yeah. So I took it from there and let it rock. Like beyond the cast, like how'd you go about, you know, getting the support for the people that are like filming and editing and making it look right? I mean, to work on a project like this, I mean, yeah, the cast is one thing, but yeah. you ain't just gonna be hiring any old body. Like, oh man, you know how to work a camera? Ah, oh, for sure, you hired. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's like, what went into like choosing the folks that were gonna be doing the behind the scenes? So there was this producer, Stephen Garcia from Waterstone Entertainment. Um, Stephen Garcia and Jeff Caligari. Um, Steven Garcia called me about another project that I have. And I was like, nah, you know what? Um, I got something that's more important. And this is why, and this is how it went down. And I told him, he said, let me read it. Sent it to him. That exact same night, I got a call back. He was like, yo, what are you doing with it? What are we doing with it? That was my response. Mm -hmm. He said, let me call Jeff. Called Jeff. And Jeff called me the next day, and Jeff was like, hey, buddy. That's how Jeff talked. He's an Italian guy. Like, you got to love him. He was like, hey, buddy. So you know I don't do short films, right? I only produce features. I said, yeah, I know that. I figured that. He said, but I got to produce this short film. I got to. And I was like, okay, thank you. And the rest was history. And they the ones that came up with the team as far as, you know, the co-producers in New York, Hanto 88. Shout out to Shruti and Rachel over there. And then they figured out, you know, who needed to do the editing and the sound. And the color. Yo, the color is just as much as important than the sound. Because when you watch this thing as a WIP, a work in progress, you think it's all good, dandy, and sweet until you see it, until you see the finished product. And you can watch it over and over again. Because I don't watch it a million times. Mm -hmm. So now now when I watch it, it's like, it's over in five minutes, although it's 27 minutes. That's how fast it goes for me. But the minute that I got it back in color and sound, it was like the first time I ever watched it. Mm-hmm. So it's a process of knowing who to choose and why you're choosing them, and especially for this type of project, because you can't just get like, you know, you might be the best editor, right. but you might not like this content. So we got to get to really know you so you, we know that you'll give 110% with what this film is about, or else you might say, you know what, screw that. I'm gonna do the film, but I'm gonna mess it up somewhere. And we didn't want that. Yeah. So they all came on board 110% and we chose the right people. I, I found it interesting that one thing you don't shy away from, because uh, a lot of times when we do films about the movement or revolution or whatever, it's, the glossy parts it's it's making it cute it's making it perfect you don't shy away from the fact that a lot of times in the the movement hated on young people and hated on women and you paint that picture in a way where it's not preachy but it it really comes across why is that well my um a woman you know they a lot of people ask me where's the woman's presence but you know where i grew up from i was born and raised in north carolina and I didn't want it to be preachy, but the, the whole structure of it came from my grandmother and my grandfather. Uh, my grandfather always had, you know, his friends over, Moses, Josh, Tom Rowe, you know, he had his, his bunch of friends over. And whenever there was an issue with either one of them, 
they would just be sitting down out in the living room or outside and my grandmother would just be walking back and forth, you know, doing her daily routines or whatnot. And she would hear this, but they never asked her once what she thought. Right. Nine times out of 10, she was the answer. She was the one that gave them the answer. And then they would just all look, you know, dumb in the face and look at each other <laughs> and be like, what the? Like, why didn't we ask her before? But they would do that repeatedly, like over and over again. So I just took what I was raised to and I included it in this film. And that's why, you know, not to, you know, spoiler alert, not, not to, you know, give it away, but that's why the woman shows up at the end because I want the audience to be like, you know, where are we? You know, if you're a female, where are we? And then that chill bump moment comes when she just comes out of nowhere. And yeah. She pretty much gives the biggest monologue that occurs in the, in the film right. towards the end. So why, why film and why short film at that? Because it seems like, you know, everybody that you sent this to, they fell in love with the script and the words. So it could have easily been a book, a long form essay and things like that. But why did you feel that film and a short film was the uh, most effective uh, medium for something like this? People like to watch TV. I think people gravitate to, I mean, there's still a lot of people that read, but I think people get a lot more out of watching and seeing and hearing than they do reading to themselves. And if it, if it was gonna be a book, it wouldn't even be out now. And I needed for this to come out ASAP. Mm-hmm. Um, it was written because it needed to be seen like ASAP. So that's why I decided to make it a short. And also because, you know, Nashawn mentioned 12 Angry Men earlier. You know, 12 Angry Men, the original version was 1957. And you know, you bet, that was like when TV first started. Wow. So that was a feature film, like an hour and 12 minutes where you're gonna be glued to the TV and not get bored, although it was only taking place in the courtroom. Mm. You know, that was the only place, it was all in the courtroom. Today, no, you can't do that for an hour. Like there's no <laughs> way I can have these guys in one room for an hour and you be like, oh, this is great. No, 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 <laughs> we had to get in, say what we had to say and get out of there and then, you know, and go handle business. So that's, that's yeah, that's the right. That's and the I, I don't know if you can name names or anything like that, but have, have you guys gotten like the, the backlash or, or festivals or companies or whatever that like, it was like, yeah, we can't show this. You wanna take that? Cause you know, I already spoke to you about it. <laughs> I, don't know. Like, I, don't, I don't know if that's, if that's the reason. I, it just, if anybody says no, to this film being film festival, it, it it has to be that either it's too much, or they don't want to deal with the subject matter or, or anything like that. But I'm like, it needs to be seen. Yeah, yeah, it it, it definitely needs to be seen. Um, put it this way: there's three film festivals that said no, and two of them, I'm okay with them saying no. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of them. I just heard back from and I'm shocked Mm. that they said no. Like I'm very shocked that they said no. Now when the the right time comes along, oh, I'm gonna let it be known to all three of them, but I don't wanna, you know, shortchange myself right now. I wanna (laughs) wait till the right time to say, you know, you guys made a mistake. But you know, two of them to me is like me trying to go to school at Yale and Harvard. You know what I mean? Like yeah. two of those film festivals are like that. When I know I can go to NYU. Mm-hmm. But when I just went to NYU, they said no. Mm-hmm. Not NYU itself. This yeah. is an example. Yeah. I'm not gonna name the film festivals right now. No, that's 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 when you hit them with uh there's this director named Sam Greenlee. He's the dude that did Spook the Set Behind the Door. And I got time, I got a chance to talk to him one time. He, and I was like, how the hell did you get this movie in theaters? Granted, it got banned, but how did you get it in the door anyway? He was like, well, shit, I just showed them a trailer with shit exploding. You know what I'm saying? Showed yeah. them guns, explosions. They're like, yeah, man, we, we gonna put this in the theater, cool. And then I got to put the real thing out. They were like, oh, no, bro. Like, we, nah, we can't show this no more. We gotta get this out of here. <laughs> but film festivals want to see a snippet, then they want to see the whole thing. So before they even make a decision. Mm. And I think, you know, and I think the two film festivals that I, I named, Yale and Harvard, they they know that it's too real for them. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, their programmers aren't, there aren't any people of color. Right. 
you know, they, they, their entire team is as white as snow. And I'm not mad at that, but understand that there is a situation. Understand that there is a problem. And it's not happening to you, but can you imagine if the shoe was on the opposite foot? Right. If we walked around like we didn't notice that African-American cops was killing white kids. Right. But no one says that. See, I'm not afraid to speak my mind. Can't be. I got kids. Right. Yeah. You know, I can't only be concerned about coffee, talking about myself in third person, walking outside. I got to be worried about coffee and my four other kids that's the same color as coffee. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's hard enough being a person of color because, to be honest with you, I have to make sure. I don't know about anyone else, but I personally have to make sure that the same way that I made my life happen the day before because I made it home 110% okay, I have to relive my life like that every single day. Every single day. And I'm a grown-ass man. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, That's real. I, I want to get into uh, some, some things that are happening right now because – like you said, the, the movie was made because this is our life, like every single day. So both of y'all, you know, you've been living in New York forever. You from New York. Mm -hmm. um, how do you guys feel about the, the news that's come out this week with uh, the, what's, what's his name, Daniel Pantaleon Man. getting fired from the NYPD and it's... for killing, for I guess not releasing the chokehold early enough. And then today they said his supervising sergeant, even though he admitted to improper protocol, his punishment will be he's losing 20 vacation hours. They say they're not firing him now? No, they're not firing. No, they're firing the Pantaleon guy, but we, they don't, they get reassigned. You know that. He'll be a cop in some other state, some other city. He's losing half of his pension. Yeah, and, but he, he's but he made. Can go somewhere. They said the GoFundMe is at like a hundred thousand dollars since wow. they announced that he got fired yesterday. That's crazy. It's just it, it's like there's still no justice. I don't I don't like he gets to go home. Yeah. He gets to go home and he gets to live his life and it's on TV. It's live. You can see it. You and you can, and they're still saying no. And finally, somebody saying this man shouldn't be on the streets because he can go and do it again. Right. And I'm, it's a little bit of, I, when, I, when I read it online, I was happy, but I was just like, it's not enough. Yeah. He should be in jail. But You're they're right. not putting their own, they're not going to do that to their own people. It's so political, it's so it's crazy. And it's like, that just fuels another cop to be able to do the same. Why should I not? And they are doing the same. I think that guy should have been fired the same you know, immediately after what he did to Eric Gardner. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I, I was, man, it's, it's, it's crazy witnessing that. Like, it's a piece in about the people where the, the celebrity actually talks about that. Hands up, hands down, comply, can't comply. That was all because of what happened to Eric Gardner. Mm -hmm. We literally saw that on tape. We yeah. saw that. We saw the footage. Before it was, well, you don't have footage, do you have proof? We have all the proof mm -hmm. in the world. Don't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter why, because we are black. Right. It's just as simple as that. I feel like what's the craziest part about it and the saddest part about it is had Eric Garner's family not been so active over mm -hmm. these last six, seven years, that officer probably would have never got fired. Like, there wouldn't have been any conversation about this at all. I People would have forgot, but they've been steadfast on pushing the line, on keeping his name alive. And honestly, I, I believe it was his daughter and, and forgive me if I'm incorrect, um, that said that they need this, the chocos need to be out, like, like they can't bring him back, but something needs to happen, and this these chocos need to be outlawed. Like, cops should not be able to use Well, them, it period. was outlawed. That, 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 that particular, to, yeah, you're, you're supposed to release to it, but I think they're saying period. Like, I mean, it's inhumane. You shouldn't be choking some. You got a gun. You got a baton. It's five got, other officers there at the same yeah, time. Yeah, like it's not necessary. Well, he wasn't doing anything wrong at all. What they saw because of his size and he was black. Yeah. Can you? If he was a white man, we I wouldn't be talking about this right no. now. And, and the same size. And the, the, the pushback on that, people will say, well, white people get killed by police, too. And when they do, the person who does it goes to jail. Goes to jail. Period. Period. It's different rules. Yeah, it's most definitely different rules. Another um, situation that derived from 
police brutality and police killings without any retribution um, is this is the the Colin Kaepernick thing. Yeah. And, oh and man. Let's. I, I, <laughs> I, I like to hear people's. I like that. I know both of these dudes are intelligent, but they also street smart. So I want to hear their opinion on it. On like how you how do you feel about the whole situation of J of Rock Nation? Because people keep saying Jay Z. Rock Nation is owned by Live Nation. Yeah. About Rock Nation making a deal with the NFL that they keep saying it's about you know rights and things of this nature, but it's an entertainment deal. It's a deal to to see to, well, to Bowl, determine right? who plays. On, at tent pole events for so first game of the season, yeah. you know what I mean. Thanksgiving, yeah, you know, stuff, Super Bowl stuff like that. What What are you guys' thoughts on this? I'm so I'm torn. Same. Because when I when I first heard about it, I was like, wait. Then he's saying this song. They need me. Yeah. I don't need them. And and it's kind of like a contradiction of, of sorts. But I think Jay, he's earned the right for us to sit and wait. And see, I mean, on the outside looking in, it looks like like he backstabbed J, JD and he, he's yeah. even going for the money and whatever. But he's done so much social conscious things, yeah. And like without even telling people, yeah. paying for people lawyers fees, doing all these different things that I have a wait and see. I want to see what he does with this. If he gets Kaepernick a job, I think a lot of people are going to be going to yeah. forgive him for for what they're mad at him for, but it's just like, he's smart. So it has to play out. And he's gonna have to take this heat until oh, yeah. it plays out because <laughs> I just think he should have never said we, we're past kneeling. That bothered me. Yeah. Because yeah. Cause we're not, we're not past kneeling. I, I, we I, need to continue to kneel yeah. while you are inside doing the work, but they still need and it still need to be seen on TV. It's still need to, it's still an issue. I definitely well, don't want to lose my train of thought before you answer that. I I agree with you 100 percent because I think people are missing the point because of Jay's explanation, which was we're past kneeling. Like the point of those things is to bring attention and you sit down and talk to the company. So what happens when the companies come to the table and say, "What do you want to do?" This was never about the NFL or any it, NFL it, team. Exactly. It was about police officers killing black men and women with no retribution. Police, to my knowledge, have not come to the table with any kind mm, of mm. compromise. So therefore, we need to still be kneeling. Yeah, and clearly, exactly. things still need to be brought to people's attention. I agree. And, and they're blackballing Kaepernick and they're not allowing him to play. And I just feel like we need, right. we need change. To, we need to be kneeling. But we also need somebody on the inside who yeah. can force these these billionaire white boy white men to listen. And they only listen to somebody who's of you know, you have you have a billion dollars, you have a billion dollars. Okay, we can yeah. have this conversation. Right. Yeah. Because you're on the same playing field now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If we're not, I'm not I don't need to I don't need to listen to you. So I think Jay is in a position to and there's no black owner in the NFL, period. You really got to be voted in to be an owner, which is crazy. Yeah. For sure. So they saying he he's buying into. I heard the Steelers. I'm not sure if how true that is, but I think that's important. I think we need to uh, look. Eighty percent of the NFL is, is black people. You're right. We need to be represented. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I I know how I feel about it. <laughs> how do you feel about it? I said, I ain't talking about shit. About I know how I feel. Yeah. I just feel like what he did, he should have went to cap first, and they should have had a conversation about well, he said he did. what. Yeah, but that turned out to be a lie. And he should have went to cap first and had that conversation because of the fact if cap didn't do what he did, then Jay wouldn't have that meeting. That meeting would have never came about. You don't go. You don't go over the person's head that started all this. You know, Kaepernick wasn't in any kind of trouble for himself. He started kneeling for us. You know, what I mean, yeah. I, he started kneeling for me. He started kneeling for you guys, Nation, everyone that's here, and my kids as well, and Nation kids. You know what I'm saying? Like, he was doing that for for us. This man gave up something that he's been trying to be pro probably since the age of four and five. 
his dreams come true. He put in all that hard work. He starts kneeling because he sees the people of color start getting killed for no apparent reason. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, he gets blackballed out the NFL. Then Rock Nation comes about. Know what Cap was standing for. You know, he has his own organ- organization out for there. Sure. Doing yeah. them, you know, they, they doing some powerful doing the things. Work. But that gets overlooked for whatever reason. And he's doing a lot. A lot of people are like saying, you know, we want to hear what Cap got to say. I personally don't think he needs to say anything. He said enough. Exactly. He has said enough. I don't need to hear what he have to say. His movements yeah. is saying enough. He moves in silence. Because once yeah. he's showing you what he's about by taking the knee for us. Because once you say something now, like all folks going to do is like twist that around and put it up. No, no, it's beef. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's yeah. like, yeah. and all it took for him was to put one knee on the ground and just say, "Look, this is my piece. This is what I have to say about it." And what Jay did, I felt like he should have went and really had a conversation man to man. Whether Cap agreed or not, disagreed, at least you sat down man to man and had this talk with him. And you're the, you're the first person who I've heard say this, that the only reason that this opportunity presented itself is because of what Cap did. So it you should go talk to him. And yeah, I, I, I'm with you, Brad, because I've heard that this deal was done a year ago. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know what I mean? And it just got announced. It's just real funny style. And I, and I don't want people to act like, and I, I, I don't feel like you have to be one way or the other. I feel like we're all humans. We all come with contradictions. We've all done things that ain't cool. So, I mean, we're not going to act like the New Jersey Nets owners didn't use Jay's face to yeah. make it cool for the exactly. Nets to move to Brooklyn yes. and give him point zero 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 one percent of the team. And Jay Money wasn't as long then as it is now. They say he's no. worth a billion. You got owners in the NFL that's worth 1.3. So him being an owner of a team is not super far-fetched. But at the same time, like, fam, your money, then this is the thing with black entertainers. Jay, every time he does huge stadiums, it's with a Justin Timberlake. It's with an Eminem. It's with his wife. Jay bread and butter is black folks. So you got to keep it real <laughs> with the people who we pay you. We are your boss at the end of the day. Because if black people don't stop fucking with Jay, it's a wrap as far as him being an artist, an entertainer. Like mm-hmm. we are his bread and butter. And, and, I, and, it's, and I, I'm somewhat torn too. I'm more on Nation's side than call Because <laughs> I want to give him the benefit of the doubt, but I, I just think it's really ignorant how people are coming across. Like, I've heard so many people who I thought were intelligent, probably still are, talk shit about Eric Reed because Eric Reed stood up for something. And I'm like, fam, if you've worked your entire life to get a job where there are 300 some odd of these jobs mm-hmm. in the world, and you're asking this dude, why is he still taking a contract for something he's worked his life? This wasn't an issue when Eric Reed came into the NFL. Yeah. You know what I mean? This, this, the black ball and the kneeling wasn't an issue. There's a huge difference between somebody playing out their contract or going to work every day for a company they've been working for before an issue had and somebody t- having a company and partnering with a company after an issue has come into play. I That's agree. two completely different things. Yeah. And I think people need to understand that. I, I don't understand the level of ignorance that yeah. some of us have when this comes. Because yeah. nobody's really thinking it out or seeing it through. It's, it's everybody's going up with emotions yeah. Yeah. and how they feel. But right. that's why I just say you, we have to wait and see. He, he might be doing something bigger than we even we even know. Mm. And, right. And, you know. But I still think he should have had that well, conversation with I think, with I Cap, think now that's what he should do now. I think how he went about it was wrong. For sure. But I'm sure what he's trying to do is in yeah, the vein of. Good. Yeah, I'm sure he has good intentions, but he should have spoke to Cap, man. Uh-huh. Like you said, this thing was a year out. They did this deal a year yeah. out, but Super Bowl was when? February? Yeah. Mm-hmm. It started then, they said. And, and that's when, when the song. It, when he refused it. Yeah, exactly. And that's when he was telling people don't do the Super Bowl. But a year ago was last what? What month are we in? September? August? August. Yeah. yeah, so come on, man. Yeah. Like, that's very disrespectful. But that's, that's, that's how, that's how <laughs> corporate sharks move. Business. That's <laughs> how business works, yeah. yes. You don't, you don't get a billion dollars, you know what I'm saying, doing Just everything. Nice. Yeah, yeah, not at all. That, that ain't how capitalism works. You know, I'm not against Jay at all. I listen to Jay music. I grew up on Jay music, but yeah. as a man, yeah. I just have to be real. 
Yeah. I'm 100. I'm blunt with everything. I'm not going to sit sure. there and try to sugarcoat something because I like you as an artist. Right. Like, I still like him as an artist, and I, and I love Kaepernick as, a, as an athlete. Nah, but I really love what Kaepernick did for us with that, and he didn't have to. Kept him 100, man. It ain't too many people. Game a job, Jay. Yeah. That's Jay Muhammad Jay Ali, yo. Job. Yeah. Nah, that is. He's Colin Muhammad Kaepernick Ali, is our, our Muhammad Ali of this generation. That's, that's treated, for sure. He's pretty much getting treated the exact same, if you remember, with Ali. Um, of course, we weren't born when it happened, right? right. I don't think any of us in the room was nah. born at that time. But with Ali, remember, they tried to send him to Vietnam. Right. Yeah, you're yeah. right. That's exactly what the NFL is doing to cap right now. Yeah, so nah, that's that's super real, um, man. What what do you hope is gonna obviously because the way the film ends is kind of like a, a cliffhanger. Like everybody wants to know what comes of this. Everyone wants to know what happens next. What, what do you do you see this as it gets bigger as it goes at different cities, like fostering at least thought amongst people? Yeah, it's gonna. I mean, the way it's just like you said. The way it's left at the end is pretty much giving people all the ideas in the world, like what are they going to do next? Like they want to follow those 10 characters and see, you know, what's next. And, of course, we looking um, for TV deals, you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. this is something that we obviously can go on, can live on and on and on mm. because it's constantly happening every day regardless on – what city or town or state you in, if you black, you're going through the exact things that we actually discuss in dialogue in this short film. Yeah. So yeah, you, you'll you see it um, living on, not sure what platform, but you know, we already been, <laughs> which is crazy, because tomorrow at Bronze Lens is our third screening, right? But we already been approached uh, from a couple platforms but you can't you know you can't jump in those things no. too quickly you right. gotta you gotta continue doing the festival and then you gotta figure things out and see which one would be the better move uh not just for you know for us uh producers but also for actors as well and you know and the people that you see actually portraying those roles they, they you know they get first dibs so you know depending on their schedules as well but we want to continue showing what these what these people you know have to showcase whether are we going to prevail or are we going to fail yeah. and it will all be scripted but it would be scripted towards what's really happening in reality mm -hmm. and not you know not some i don't know if you can curse up there or not sure not some bullshit because you know that's one oh, of the ain't things no cuss word man <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's a regular word <laughs> because you know that's one of the things that um with Jeff and Steven, when I spoke to them after they read it and they said, you know, Jeff said, yes, we, we, I want to do this thing. My first thing was we can't sugarcoat. Like, I know how Hollywood works when it comes to scripts. Mm -hmm. You know, they want to delete this. They want to cut this down so it can make sense or so, you know, the other audience can understand it. And I was like, no, we can't do that. Mm -hmm. This is as thorough as it can be, and we're not going to take anything out of this. And we're not going to add anything on top of this. Because if they don't understand it, it's because they don't want to understand it. Right. But this is what we're going through every single fucking day. And yeah, they agree. True. They didn't. They was like, you know what? We totally agree. And they let it rock the way that it, you know, is edited to right now. Any, uh, any other festivals on deck? Yeah, we got the Newark uh, International Film Festival on deck uh, and a couple of other festivals that are reaching out to us, like the Ed Film Festival, uh, which is in Williamsburg. And also, um, there's, a, there's a film festival in Texas. I can't remember the name, but, and, and Richmond, Virginia. Like, there's a lot of people, you know, it's crazy. Yeah, it's great because what's crazy is that all of these people are hitting the DM. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, and if you guys are listening and watching this, I see your DMs <laughs> <laughs> about, you know, you know, submitting towards their film festivals. But I can't submit them to all because you have to be careful with this type of film. Like, I'm from North Carolina. I would love to go home and show it. Yeah. But North Carolina is a very flat state. Yeah. I don't know, you know, I think everybody knows what that means. Yeah. I'm not trying to go down there and stir up problems when there's already enough problems in North Carolina. Mm. So, therefore, I won't be showing at home. So, 
I actually have my relatives driving to Atlanta um, okay. tomorrow to come see it here in Atlanta, That's what's which up. is kind of like the closest I can get to home. So it's kind of like a homecoming for me. Right. Although right. Atlanta is six hours away from where I'm from in North Carolina. <laughs> right. Nah, that's big, man. Tell people um, where they where they can find the uh, the film and, and and find you guys on social media and websites and whatnot. Uh, uh, IG, I am Nation Kears, and Nation Kears on Facebook. And for about the people IG, you can go to about the people film. And my personal IG is uh, that coffee boy T H A T. C-O-F-F-E-Y, boy, B-O-Y. For sure. Yo, definitely appreciate y'all coming through, man. Great conversation. Make sure that you guys keep an eye out, follow him on IG so you can know where the film will be screened. It's something that everybody needs to see, for sure. Thank you. Yeah, and I just have one last thing, yeah. or two last things. Thank you guys for interviewing oh, us yeah. about yes. this. Thanks for also, me. thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you did a hell of a job. Wait till you see it. Well, wait till you see it. Brandon saw it. I forgot he saw it, but yeah. he did a hell of a job as the professor. He actually had the hardest words. You was, when you see it, you were, like <laughs> like I did that intentionally. Yeah, and that's why he got the professor because he had to pronounce every single letter in whatever word that. He was sounding like Cornell West Dyson. Yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> pretty much. Yeah. But yeah, man, thanks a lot, guys. I Thank appreciate, you, appreciate it. Most you guys. definitely, it's all love, bro. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank y'all for watching. Thank y'all for listening, man. Make sure you subscribe, rate, and review, and tell a friend. See y'all next week with another dope show. Peace. Peace. What? Gonna take a couple shots.